Welcome to the Cold Spring Harbor Library and Environmental Center's presentation about Rosalie Gardner Jones and the women's suffrage movement. I'd like to start by mentioning that this presentation is broken into two parts. The first being an overview of the entire women's suffrage movement in the United States, while the second is about Rosalie and her contributions to the women's suffrage movement roughly a century ago. Although you, the viewer, might be familiar with women's suffrage movement and may wish to skip to the second part about Rosalie immediately, I still highly recommend watching the first part as it discusses the reality of the conflicts and struggles the movement experienced as opposed to the usual look at it. Elizabeth Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and the Seneca Falls, followed by the 19th Amendment being passed 70 odd years later. The first part also describes events and explains the background of people that the second part will regularly reference. Additionally, it will help give context to Rosalie's actions. Last and briefly, because I'd like to get to the focus of the presentation as soon as possible, and because it isn't really a very uh, interesting topic, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Scott. I am a reference librarian at the Coldsby Harbor Library, and I oversee the development of our history and science collection, as well as some other small collections. I mentioned my focus on history and science because it is a fundamental part of my personality to seek out the truth about our universe and our species, regardless of any emotional attachment to previously held ideas and beliefs or the comfort that they provide. There might be information or perspectives conveyed in this presentation that could be seen as controversial by some, but I hope all those watching realize that their inclusion is intended to help us honestly question our own previously held beliefs, which in turn is the first genuine step towards finding the truth. I must also emphasize that any opinions or comments stated by me are mine alone and not that of the Cold Spring Harbor Library, its board, or any other employees therein. My intent is not to offend, but to challenge. Moving on, let's take a look at the history of women's suffrage, which is far more interesting than what most of us probably learned in the classroom. Despite the most commonly related narrative, the women's suffrage movement was not one of a singular march towards victory held in its early stage by those two giants of history named Elizabeth Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Indeed, it can be argued that Stanton and Anthony are in the history books because they quite literally wrote it that way. Taking the time to assess the women's suffrage movement in the, a more balanced and admittedly critical eye will in turn help place Rosalie Gardner Jones's actions into proper perspective, giving the later generation the full credit they deserve. The history of women's suffrage in America began in New Jersey when the constitution of 1776 gave all property owning adults the right to vote regardless of gender. This enlightened viewpoint was further confirmed in 1790 and 1797, but ultimately revoked in 1807. With the exception of this forgotten anomaly and false start, the story of women's suffrage resumes its familiar course. Nothing of further note occurred until the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. The convention was organized by and primarily comprised of Quakers, who were notably progressive in their regards to women's rights. One of the leaders, uh, excuse me, one of the notable attendees was Lucretia Mott, who was a cousin of Benjamin Franklin and an outspoken abolitionist known for her oratory skills in, in an age when women were not often permitted to speak in public. Due to Mott's presence and its inherent boost to the convention's coverage in the newspapers, a then unknown local Quaker, Elizabeth Stanton, pushed for women's suffrage to be included in the convention's re resolutions. Despite the convention promoting greater women's rights, the concept of suffrage was seen by many as perhaps too extreme. Even Lucretia Mott called for suffrage to be removed from the convention's list of resolutions. Nevertheless, enough attendees, including Frederick Douglass, seen here, argued successfully for its inclusion. Several other less famous conventions followed Seneca Falls in the subsequent weeks and months, finding growing strength in the abolitionist circles where it germinated. Although a Quaker from Rochester, New York, Susan B. Anthony did not attend the convention held there a couple weeks after Seneca Falls, which had also pushed for women's rights and suffrage. While her sister and mother both attended, Susan was not in the area at the time. Despite missing these famous early events, she eventually joined the suffrage movement and met Elizabeth Stanton, and the two became an effective team which com complemented each other's strengths. Stanton was known for her speaking skills, while Anthony was a better administrator and organizer. 
the two worked closely for roughly the next 50 years in such capacity. In the wake of the Civil War, the women's suffrage movement encountered difficulty when there was a debate amongst the suffragists about whether to insist on women's suffrage being a part of the 15th Amendment, which would likely hold up its resolution, or to support the amendment without a caveat, so it could pass earlier. And of course, the 15th Amendment was about giving uh, African Americans the right to vote and rights in general. Stanton and Anthony opposed passing the amendment without women's suffrage being attached. Indeed, Anthony made the statement that an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race where the Saxon, meaning white, rules the African, might be endured. But surely this oligarchy of sex, which makes the men of every household sovereigns, masters, the women subjects, slaves, carrying dissension, rebellion into every home of the nation cannot be endured. In other words, Susan B. Anthony was stating that injustice to the poor, uneducated, and or minorities are all more tolerable situations than injustice to women. One would be challenged not to view this as a highly self-centered, self-serving, and selfish viewpoint from a person who is neither poor, uneducated, nor a minority. There was also a fear in their faction that passing the 15th Amendment without an inclusion of women's suffrage would put the movement back for even further, as doing so would increase the number of male voters by adding a group who was disproportionately against suffrage. Being a minority is no more an inoculation against being a misogynist than being female is an inoculation against being racist. As Frederick Douglass once admitted about the interaction between African-American males and women's suffrage, the race to which I belong have not generally taken the right ground on this question. Douglas, despite his personal strong support for women's suffrage, believed that the passing the 15th Amendment was a matter of life and death for African Americans, a group who was facing potential death and injury in addition to the legal inequity that both groups experienced. Thinking along the same lines as Douglas, many of the male abolitionists who proved strong allies to the suffragists in the past couple of decades voted to pass the amendment without mention of women's suffrage. To be clear, the split was not along gender lines. In fact, many prominent female suffragists supported the uh, 15th Amendment passing, such as Lucy Stone, seen here in the center, and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper on the left. It is from this conflict of views and stances on the 15th Amendment that a schism arose in the suffrage movement. Those opposed to this, the passing of the 15th Amendment, such as Ant Stanton and Anthony, formed the National Women's Suffrage Association, or NWSA, while those who supported the passing of the 15th Amendment, such as Harper, Stone, and Stone's husband, Henry Blackwell, seen here on right, formed the American Women's Suffrage Association, or AWSA. For the next 20 years, these rival organizations both campaigned for suffrage separately and uncooperatively. The AWSA could be called the less extreme or fanatical of the two groups. To give examples, the AWSA allowed men to join, focused purely on suffrage as opposed to other women's rights efforts, supported traditional institutions like marriage and religion, focused on state-by-state -state ratification of suffrage, and employed less aggressive tactics in achieving that. The NWSA, on the other hand, only allowed men, women to join, excuse me, supported all women's rights issues, saw marriage and religion as unjust to women, and focused on national suffrage through a new amendment. Rightly or wrongly, the NWSA's viewpoints were likely self-defeating as they fed into the anti-suffragist criticism that suffragists were just men hating spinsters, despite the reality that many of them were married. This view from the outside was only shaken loose in the last decade of the movement, and probably one of the reasons it finally succeeded at that time. During the same period, counter movements against the suffrage also began to form. Despite modern perception that women's suffrage was a movement where one support or opposition fell along gender lines, the truth was far more complex. As seen with the AWSA and Quakers, there were a fair number of enlightened men who supported the movement since its inception. Conversely, there were actually fewer, a fair number of women who were opposed to women's suffrage. These anti-suffragists or antis were groups comprised of women who rather ironically argued that women should not get political. In this cartoon, the poorly thought out and hilariously acronymed anti-suffrage society is lampooning the feudal uh, belief that what is good for one's ancestor is inherently good for oneself. 
through the use of fashion. The Anthes had various reasons for opposing suffrage, but by and large, it was seen as a conservative movement to prevent changing the status quo. For some, it was a religious belief stemming from the tradition that women were expected to focus on the domestic fear, efficiently described by the contemporary imperial German phrase of Kinder, Küche, and Kirche, literally kids, kitchen, and church. The, the suffrage movement was seen by conservatives of the time as an attack on traditional family values, a view which the NWSA didn't do much to assuage. The other primary reason for female anti-suffrage support were accusations that suffragists were socialists or anarchists. Collectively, the antis also claimed they were the voice of the silent majority of women who did not want to get involved in politics. Though this seems to not be based on in any reality besides they are instead originating in their own echo chambers. When reflecting on suffragists and the anti-suffragist conflict, one cannot help but notice the remarkable similarities to contemporary politics, albeit about different topics. To go even further, the suffragists were often unfairly depicted as unattractive man-haters or spinsters in a similar way to how currently more radical feminists often unfairly depict male detractors as overweight and balding or call them incels, which means involuntary celibates. To, in both cases, to undermine the arguments of the enemy and imply that they are angry only because no one is attracted to them. This comparison is an excellent example that neither side of the, any social or political spectrum is inherently above dehumanizing their opponents for their own gain. As Mark Twain is alleged to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Despite all the challenges in this period, there were some successes for women's suffrage on the state level. All the states, or more accurately, territories that ratified women's suffrage were exclusively in the West starting with Wyoming in 1869. There is some belief that these were efforts to entice women from the East to provide potential wives for settlers. Whatever the motivation, the deed was done, and over time, some Western territories and states began passing women's suffrage laws without their societies imploding upon themselves. Around this time, Susan B. Anthony's most confrontational moment in the name of suffrage occurred when in 1872, she was arrested in Rochester, New York, for attempting to vote for Ulysses S. Grant as president. She was brought to trial and eventually sentenced to pay a $100 fine, though she never paid the fine or was sent to prison for her failure to do so. Soon after, in 1876, Anthony and other NWSA members, like Stanton, began writing a multiple volume work on the history of the women's suffrage movement. In the process, they essentially ignored the deeds of the AWSA and its leaders, like Stone and Harper, while purely focusing on the actions of the NWSA, namely Stanton and Anthony themselves. It's only in 1881 through the level-headed intervention of Elizabeth Stanton's daughter, Harriet, that any mention of AWSA was included. Harriet was then tasked with writing a major chapter in the second volume on the AWSA and its contributions. Harriet, Harriet herself would continue on as a suffragist of merit and continue to show the same independence of thought from her famous mother that she displayed in regards to the AWSA chapter, eventually seeing the fruition of all her hard work in 1920. Although going some way in reconciling the two groups, Harriet's contribution was only one chapter in what would ultimately be a four volume collection. By the 1880s, the AWSA started to shrink and in 1890 it merged with the NWSA under the organization's leadership, namely Stanton and Anthony, and thereby creating the and National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NAWSA. As such, this is another case of history being written by the winners. Despite the end of the schism, NAWSA stagnated in its first couple decades while understanding and Anthony. The same comfort, comfortable tactics of conventions and fundraisers were employed up until their deaths in 1902 and 1906, respectively. Several years later, while under the leadership of Anna How Howard Shaw, NAWSA and the women's suffrage movement began to shake off some of its rust, despite Shaw's leadership that was typically described as mediocre. In the words of the now married ha Harriet Stanton Blatch, the movement was completely in a rut. It bored its adherents and compelled, it repelled its opponents. Shaw did make a wise decision in beginning to focus on women from wealthier households while with the so-called society plan that was particularly successful in New York, Connecticut, and Rhode Island areas. This combined with the state of Washington 
becoming the fifth state to pass women's suffrage caused the NAWSA and the movement as a whole to gain some social standing. Indeed, it was described by one member in 1910 as having previously had about as much energy as a dying kitten, what is now a big, virile, threatening thing, and also actually quite fashionable. Regardless of the arguably vain motivation present with some of the members of the movement in what would be its last decade, the movement gained the necessary numbers needed to be successful and stay in the public spotlight. This is not to say all or even most of the new wave of wealthier adherents were not dedicated. Indeed, many like Rosalie Gardner Jones who joined around this time were apparently very dedicated. It must be also be said, generally speaking, and particularly at this time, those completely dedicated to a social cause typically were blessed with the finances to do so. Working class mother will rarely have the time or energy to physically support or a social cause, even if their heart does, far less so in an age before social welfare vacation days. It's difficult to care about a so social issues when one is struggling to support one's family. This view is most succinct succinctly described using Maslow's pyramid, and sadly, it still appears to be a lesson lost on many politicians to this day. Around this time, in roughly 1910, some young individuals returned to the United States with new weapons in their arsenal, having learned them from more aggressive British suffragists. One of the British influenced individuals was the Quaker Alice Paul, who became the de facto leader of the movement in its last decade and formed the National Women's Party with Lucy Burns. The two, like Stanton and Anthony, functioned well as a team and made up for each other's deficiencies, with Burns being more personable and likable, whereas Paul was driven and at times abrasive. However, however, Paul was very capable and able to ch change the suffrage culture by focusing on national suffrage instead of the glacially slow state by state method, arguing to hold the political party in power accountable for failures and increasing Increased implementation of more visible yeah, gatherings. The first organized, organized movement by Alice Paul and Lucy Burns for NAWSA was on March 3rd, 1913, when the women's suffrage procession made its way through Washington, D.C. The march was notable for being the first large organization march, organized march in, on Washington, D.C. for political reasons. The reported turnout in demonstrators was between 5,000 and 10,000 individuals, but attracted a significant number of onlookers as an estimated 250,000 to 500,000 people who were mostly present for Woodrow Wilson's upcoming inauguration looked on. Indeed, the march had the effect Alice Paul hoped for in drawing attention away from the arrival of Wilson for his inauguration the following day. Wilson himself noticed the small gathering for the arrival, and when inquiring about the reason for it, was told that everyone was watching the woman suffrage possession. The path of the demonstrators led them down Pennsylvania Avenue from Peace Monument, past the Treasury Building, onto the White House, and finally at Continental Hall. To protect the marchers, a group of only 100 officers was assigned. This was a woefully inadequate force to deal with any troubles, so Alice Paul had the foresight to have one of the suffragists ask her brother-in-law, Secretary of War Stimson, seen here, to have the cavalry provide extra security. Despite initial hesitance due to the belief that the army was prohibited from such use in the capital, Stimson agreed to deploy them in an emergency. March was intended to be preceded by a small force of mounted police in a wedge formation in order to drive any crowds out of the path of the oncoming marchers, who were led by a New York lawyer Inez Milholland, seen here, on a white horse. Unfortunately, the timing was out of sync and the gap between the police wedge and the marshes was too long. So crowds began to recoalesce in the vacant space, where, thereby causing difficulty for the marchers. In response, the marshes began to create their own wedge, joining Milholland with other horses and even cars to try to force a way through the mass of humanity in front of them. All around, a mixture of hecklers and supporters called out to the marchers. Unfortunately, the increasingly rowdy behavior of hecklers, such as these fine pieces of humanity here, began to cause problems. 
Chief of Police Sylvester, who was at the train station waiting for Wilson, heard about the situation and placed a call for the cavalry that Stimson's promised. Before the cavalry arrived, some of the onlookers took it upon themselves to provide assistance to the marchers. Most notably, there were Boy Scouts with batons pushing the crowds back, some soldiers linking arms to create a barrier against the surging crowd, and some of the African-American float drivers got out to assist as well. At times, the squeeze of the crowd had caused the parade to move only in a single file. But eventually, with the assistance of the previously mentioned Good Samaritans and the eventual arrival of the cavalry, marchers reached their destination at the Memorial Continental Hall. In the aftermath, and just as with the recent events on January 6th in Washington, DC, the actions of the Capitol Police were called into question. It was obvious to all that the individual officers were overwhelmed by the number the, in the crowd. The point Alice Paul herself initially voiced sympathy towards before realizing it was more politically advantageous for the suffrage movement to stoke public outrage and exaggerate their portrayal as victims, which of course at its core was true. Police Sylvester, Chief Sylvester bore the brunt of the criticism, not without merit. Nevertheless, his failures were primarily from inadequate preparation instead of incorrect action once the problems occurred. And he was eventually exonerated, though his reputation was marred. Despite the controversy and chaos, the woman suffers possession was a resounding success. The turnout of marchers, spectators, and prominent news co coverage ensured that the primary goal of increasing the movement's public profile was achieved. The women's suffrage possession showed that the new generation of suffragists like Alice Paul and Rosalie Gardner Jones had come to realize that in order to be successful, the movement needed to be ingrained in the public consciousness by staying in the news cycle, something they accomplished successfully. Alice Paul was similar to other leaders in history, such as Ulysses S. Grant, who were successful where their sometimes capable predecessors failed because they, had, they were perceptive enough to see the path to victory and what was needed to accomplish it. In the case of the suffrage movement, victory came from large marches, constant taking of tasks to ruling party, and in the end, a constant picketing of the White House by a group called the Silent Sentinels. This later event occurred between January 1917 and June 21st, 1919, when the 19th Amendment was passed by both the House and Senate. During that time, the rotating vigil of picketers, which involved nearly 2,000 suffragists across its entire length of time, were often subject to verbal abuse and accusations of being unpatriotic after the April 1917 declaration of war on Germany in World War I. The women were often, also often arrested and jailed for their cause, typically on charges of obstructing traffic. The worst case of this occurred on the night of November 14, 1917, when during the so-called Night of Terror, many suffragists who were being held at the Occoquan workhouse were beaten, dragged, choked, pinched, and kicked by the guards under the orders of the superintendent. Lucy Burns was beaten and left overnight chained to her cell door with her hands above her head. Further, those suffragists who decided to undergo a hunger strike were forced fed through the mouth, nose, or even anus. These deplorable actions caused popular opinion to shift in the suffragists' favor. In fact, Wilson himself shifted his stance in January 1918, voicing his support for women's suffrage. The House of Representatives passed the amendment a few days later, but the Senate refused to vote on it until October 1918, when it failed by only two votes. A sub subsequent resumption of protests placed pressure on the politicians, and after another passing of the amendment by the House of Representatives in May 1919, the Senate finally passed the amendment in June 1919. The movement then shifted towards pressuring, pressuring states to ratify the amendment. The last of these 36 necessary states to ratify it was Tennessee in August 1920. Its passing there occurred in dramatic fashion when a single tie-breaking vote by Harry T. Byrne was cast. Byrne had been leaning towards voting against the ratification, but after he was sent a telegram by his mother telling him to, in truncated quotation, be a good boy and vote for suffrage, did he change his position. With that final act, the 72 year campaign for women's suffrage ended in victory. This is the end of part one.